So I'm going to be talking about research, but I'm also going to be talking a little bit about management because that didn't quite get dealt with this morning. Chris was primarily talking about boreal caribou. These technically are not boreal caribou. So I'm working in the, uh, the area around Dawson Creek, this area in here. And again, this then shows the distribution of caribou in British Columbia. We've got the boreal caribou that Conrad just talked about. In BC, we recognize these mountain caribou, which is different than the term mountain caribou as it's used in, in Alberta. These are caribou that live in the deep snow belt area and feed almost exclusively on arboreal lichens in old growth subalpine forests. These green herds are more like uh, what Alberta would consider mountain caribou. They live in the mountains, but they feed in, uh, on terrestrial lichens in pine forests or on windswept alpine ridges. Now, so these caribou that I'm going to be talking about in the piece are these northern ecotype herds of woodland caribou. And the green here is the Southern Mountains National Ecological Area, which was also talked about this morning. So what that means is these herds in BC are mountain caribou, some of our northern ecotype caribou, but also the caribou, the mountain caribou in West Central BC are in the Southern Mountains National Ecological Area. And we've been dealing with them up to now as being a threatened species um, under SARA, because that's the, their current designation. But that sort of is lumping together a bunch of these, these different herds here. And uh, this area here contains about 8,000 caribou. And although many of the herds aren't doing very well, some of these here in, in central BC are actually doing okay. So that's why they're nationally listed as threatened. However, what's also been mentioned this morning is COSIWIC just approved a new classification system that they're going to be using in the future for designating caribou uh, at risk status. And we now have this new, um, oops, didn't mean to do that. There we go. We have this new DU here, number eight, the Central Rocky Mountains. This is going to be a new DU that's going to be used in the future for evaluating the status of, of these different caribou herds. So what this herd, this represents then, are the herds that I'm going to talk about here today in British Columbia, but then also the herds in West Central BC, or West Central Alberta, the uh, Red Rock Prairie Creek, um, Jasper, and Alapesh. So in the future, this is going to be the unit that's going to be considered um, when, when, when Kosiewicz is, is evaluating whether these herds are threatened and endangered. This area today has less than a thousand caribou in it, and as you know, most of these herds are declining. So it's pretty likely that when the new evaluation comes out, these, this DU8 here, the Central Rocky Mountains, is going to be an endangered population, and it's just going to increase the conservation concern even higher than it is today. So again then, within BC, the herds we have within this area that I'm going to be talking about, we've got Kennedy Siding, We've got the Scott, Moberly, Burnt Pine, Quintet, the Narrow Way we share with Alberta, and then further south of there, you guys have uh, Red Rock, Prairie Creek, Alapesh, and Jasper. So the population trend on the herds, at least in British Columbia, is not good. The Scott herd, uh, just about 35 caribou. We actually don't do much work on those. We don't really know. That's an old number. There may not be any there anymore. Kennedy siding, down to 45, declining. There was 120 in 2007. Major decline occurred there, primarily due to one really bad summer when we had really high predation over the summer months. Uh, the Moberly herd, down to 35. There was 191 back in 1995. We know that over those years, the calf recruitment hasn't been adequate to balance adult mortality. The bird hop pine. A little herd down to five, they could be gone by now. Uh, there were 13 in 2008, there was maybe 30 or 40 back in the 1990s. Again, over these years, the calf recruitment just hasn't been adequate to balance adult mortality. The quintet is the one herd that still seems to be relatively abundant. Uh, a good census there of 175, and we know that over the years, calf recruitment has been adequate to, 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 to balance out the adult mortality. 
we get down to these two herds, they're harder to count. These previous herds are up in the mountains. We can actually do aerial census and uh, have sightability corrections for them. These guys are down in the boreal forest and they're hard to count. So these are more minimum counts or best guesses, but 50 and 100. And in both cases, they're likely continuing to decline because year after year, calf recruitment's not enough to balance the adult mortality. So we've been doing radio telemetry on these caribou since 2002, so a dec over a decade now, I guess a decade now, and worked out the different uh, ranges and habitat use patterns for these animals. It shows the different herds then. Uh, this green herd here, this is actually a mountain caribou herd, so we're not going to be talking about that. Uh, this is Kennedy Siding, the Scott in blue, Moberly, Burnt Pine, Quintet, then we're down to the Bear Hole Red Willow, so that's the Quintet, Bear Hole Red Willow, and then down to the Narrowway Herd. Uh, the way these colors work are the, win the winter locations are triangles, so they appear to be black or darker here. So the general pattern that occurs with these caribou is, is they tend to summer more in the central core of the Rocky Mountains. But then come winter time, the guys on the west move out to the western edge, and the guys on the east move out to the eastern edge. I'm going to primarily talk about the ones on the eastern side, which are these ones uh, that are more similar to the ones further south into Alberta. So starting out then with the, in the Moberly and the Burnt Pine and the Quintet, these guys, when they move out onto winter range, they're only moving out onto the eastern edge of the Rocky Mountains, and they're remaining in the mountains throughout the winter, feeding on windswept alpine ridges, sometimes dropping down in the adjacent subalpine forest, but basically staying up on top of the mountains. South of there, though, when we get down into the Bear Hole Red Willow and the Narrowway, they keep moving, so they've been up here in the mountains in the summertime, but they keep moving, and here they're actually wintering out on the boreal forest. So they're out in pine, spruce forest, cratering for the lichens under the snow. So again, those, those top northern herds, the Moberly, the Burnt Pine, and Quintet, are wintering primarily on windswept alpine ridges. And in terms of habitat protection, these are climax ecosystems, these old growth subalpine forests and these alpine areas. So from a management recommendation, where a recommendation would be that there should be uh, no destruction of any of this core habitat by industrial development. But then when we get to these guys here, the uh, Bear Hole Red Willow and Narrowway, these guys then are moving right out into the boreal forest. So they're down in these boreal forests and they use pine stands where they crater for terrestrial lichens. They use old growth spruce stands where they eat their boreal lichens out of the trees. There's some variation there depending on how much snow there is in the winter. Now in contrast to the caribou up in the mountains, these guys are, are in a, an ecosystem that's adapted to natural disturbance, a free, frequent wildfire regime of the boreal forest. In fact, we, we, our understanding is that terrestrial lichens are actually a successional species and actually require periodic disturbance in order to regenerate these sites. So when we get down onto the boreal forest, rather than complete protection, the management recommendation is more of a, an ecosystem-based natural disturbance model, like Elson talked about, to manage the disturbance on a pattern and scale to simulate the natural disturbance and continue to ensure that there's always large patches of uh, middle-aged, mature forest to provide terrestrial lichens for these caribou. Again, in the summer range, all these caribou move back into the central core of the Rocky Mountains. This is relatively pristine wilderness in most areas, and, and there's eating a, a wide variety of green vegetation back there, and our primary concern there would simply be to ensure that, that there's a, a tolerable level of predation occurring into those areas. We've also done wolf research in this area. This was a project we did that was funded by CAP uh, several years ago. And we've mapped the, the wolf territories that are in that area. So the interesting thing is, is we've got a couple packs of wolves here that are down low in the boreal forest. So those are the guys that are overlapping the low elevation winter range of the bear hole red willow caribou and the narrowway caribou. And then we also have these different wolf packs that live in the valley bottoms 
of the Rocky Mountains. And they're the ones that then are predating on the caribou during the summer months or potentially on things like the quintet caribou in, in the wintertime. So we've uh, used telemetry data and we've done habitat ma mapping, we've developed resource selection functions for these different herds. That was done a few years ago, it's been recently redone and we're in the process of redoing it again because as we continue to get telemetry data, we continue to, up to update these, uh, these habitat models. So for example, this is the uh, uh, highly selected winter habitat for the quintet caribou herds. And actually what it represents is simply the higher elevation alpine and adjacent subalpine fringe within their range. And we've used the summer range and the winter range, RSFs, to develop core habitat maps for these animals. So here in the quintet caribou, uh, the blue is core winter range, which may also be used as summer range. And the green is core summer range, which isn't used as winter range. So we have these core habitat maps available based on habitat modeling and telemetry to help guide land use planning practices. We try to use this information then to guide a variety of uh, land use decisions. Uh, for, for, for the forestry, uh, the tools we have available that have been mentioned are under the winter ranges and wildlife habitat areas under the Forest and Range Practices Act. And these are the under the winter ranges and wildlife habitat areas that are in place for forestry. And as you can see, this is up in the Moberly, Burnt Pine, Quintet. Uh, this covers most of those high elevation alpine and adjacent subalpine forest habitats that are used by those caribou that remain up in the windswept alpine. And the management prescription here is no road building or forest harvesting in those subalpine forests adjacent to that alpine habitat. Down on the boreal forest, we have this very large ungulate winter range. And that's the low elevation winter range used by the bear hole red willow and the, uh, the narrowway caribou. But this is, uh, again, an ecosystem that's adapted to periodic or actually fairly frequent natural disturbance by wildfire. So the management prescription here is not no harvesting, but rather a scale and pattern of harvesting to mimic the natural disturbance pattern so that at any point in time, there's going to be large patches of mature forest providing terrestrial lichens for the caribou. The problem is these things only apply to the forest industry. So if the forest industry follows this pattern, it can be severely compromised when other industries are then coming along and putting in other types of developments in the leave areas. And again, like Elson talked about, it's, it's this cumulative effects. It's difficult for any one industry to try to deal with this if other industries aren't, aren't sort of working in a compatible mode. So this low elevation on the winter range isn't, isn't being managed particularly well, because even though the forestry patches are being scattered around, the intervening leave areas are, are eroded and, and fragmented with a, lo a lot of uh, cut blocks, or I'm sorry, seismic lines and uh, well sites and any other types of developments going on out there. And again, the, the, the rationale for that low elevation management pattern is our understanding is that these uh, pine lichen types are a successional stage. Then if they start to get too old, the mosses start to take over. And, uh, and uh, eventually that turns into a spruce forest with a moss understory. So we actually want to manage these things with a periodic disturbance in order to continue to be regenerating these, these pine lichen types somewhere out there on the managed landscape. So our general prescription for these low elevation boreal uh, ungulate winter ranges was that at any point in time, again, half of the area had to be in the 50 to 100 year age class of uh, mature forest that would be providing pine lichen habitat, whereas up to half of it could be uh, less than 50 and in a period in, in the process of starting to regenerate some of those characteristics. And also that this harvesting is done on a fairly large cut leave area to minimize the level of fragmentation. The problem with many of these areas now and in the future though is that they're almost completely attacked by mountain pine beetle. And our plans are going out the window because basically all of these stands are now dead. Uh, we've had this experiences 
longer ago, further west in British Columbia, where the mountain pine beetles started. And I've been doing research in the Kennedy Siding Herd, uh, where mountain pine beetle totally killed the low elevation winter range back in 2008. Uh, Kennedy Siding caribou, again, they summer up in the mountains, but in the early winter they come down to this low elevation pine forest. They stay there until about uh, January, then they, they also move back up the mountains. But I've been studying the caribou use of this low elevation pine forest here, which, as I said, in 2006 was completely attacked and killed by, by mountain pine beetle. And we've continued to monitor what happens there in terms of the vegetation of the caribou. And, and what happens is that each year the caribou continue to come back and continue to use this stand, even though it's completely dead. We know that the terrestrial lichens are declining. And the main reason the terrestrial lichens are declining is they're losing out in competition to vascular shrubs. And we've had this research actually occur further west in, in BC as well. It kind of varies depending on where you are. In some cases, it's, it's bearberry. In some cases, it's blueberry. In some places, it's ligonberry. But wherever, when you kill the overstory of a pine stand, these uh, creeping shrubs tend to increase due to more moisture and light and outcompete the lichens. So one of the effects of uh, a mountain pine beetle is the terrestrial lichens are going to actually start declining due to competition. But that said, there's, there's still terrestrial lichens there, so these caribou continue to feed on the remaining arboreal and terrestrial lichens, at least in the short term. Concern is, of course, when the trees start to fall down, there's not going to be any arboreal lichens there. But at least in the short term, it, it continues to provide habitat. So we've had to address this, and the way we've dealt with this on these ungulate winter ranges is said that if you do have an ungulate winter range for caribou low elevation winter range, uh, you can salvage log up to half of it in large patches to try to get the pattern of succession started over again, but we're going to be retaining half of that area as standing dead forest in order to provide habitat at least for the immediate future because we know the caribou do continue to use it. So that was the forest industry. Another issue that's, that's happening on a lot of these ranges is, is wind power development. We've had a number of wind power plants go in. Or, uh, so far, they've tended to be in areas that aren't, aren't good caribou habitat. But virtually all of, of, of the, the core habitat has at least investigative use permits by some uh, wind farm company. But we think that uh, there's good opportunity here to have a fairly significant development in the wind power industry in this area without actually um, going on to any core habitat. Again, these caribou are primarily coming out to the southern edge of the, uh, the, of the Rocky Mountains on these windswept alpine ridges. Uh, and yet, there's good opportunities, and, and to date, all of the existing wind farms have actually occurred further east of that out onto various forested ridges out in the boreal forest, which aren't particularly good caribou habitat. So for example here, this is the telemetry data for the uh, Quintet caribou herd. Uh, this is a wind farm that's under construction. This is one here that's under environmental assessment, as is this one. Uh, these two here are soon to be going under environmental assessment. So you know we've got all these different wind farm uh, proposals that don't have any significant overlap with caribou, so that's good. However, we also have others, like this one here, which is smack dab in the, the middle of a, a very core caribou habitat. And just another example here, here we have a wind farm proposal shown in gray that occurs between the, uh, the uh, bird pine and, and the uh, quintet. And again, no real conflict there, so we're hoping that there's going to be enough opportunities for wind farms to have significant development in the piece without necessarily having to encroach on any of the, the core caribou habitat. In terms of oil and gas development, this is primarily a concern out on the, the low elevation boreal winter ranges for the Narroway and the uh, Bear Hole Red Willow. Most there's, there's, to date, fairly limited development in the mountains, and when they, they do go in, the the, the well sites tend to be sort of mid-slope and directionally drilling into, into the gas deposits. Uh, there's no real interest or need to go right up onto those high elevation windswept ridges to access the gas. But when they're down on the boreal forest, of course, there's a complete kind of overlap of the, uh, 
of the low elevation winter range. Um, what do we know? Well, we know that already the level of disturbance exceeds the threshold provided in Sorensen et al. <clears throat> One possibility, though, is that these guys will be somewhat more tolerant than boreal caribou of that level of disturbance, because remember, they're only there in the winter, whereas boreal caribou are on those land, those, those boreal ranges year-round. These guys are heading off into the mountains for the summertime, so they might be able to tolerate a somewhat higher level of disturbance. That said, these herds are all currently declining under the current condition based on what we know about calf recruitment and adult mortality. And our most challenging one by far though in these areas, particularly uh, for the caribou that winter in the windswept alpine ridges are coal mines. Because here we just have, uh, so we call it the wicked problem this morning. We have caribou who want to live on these windswept alpine ridges and coal mines result in turning these things into large holes. And there's no resolution about this, right? You cut down trees, they'll grow back. You build a seismic line, it'll grow back. You build an open pit mine, and you've destroyed caribou habitat forever. And, and in their environmental reviews, the, the companies acknowledge this, that there's going to be a permanent destruction of X amount of caribou habitat. So right now, these things are in various stages of development and uh, under environmental assessment. But the problem we have is that much of the land has already been, uh, been tenured for coal mines. So this map here shows the Quintet Caribou winter locations. Black ones are the ones that are, well, let's go the other way around. The blue ones are in areas that have already been tenured for coal. The red ones are in areas where there's outstanding tenures that have been applied for. The black ones are the ones that are outside areas that have current, any current interest in tenuring for coal. The problem is, what's the number here? 83% of the caribou winter locations of the, of the quintet caribou herd are in areas that have already been tenured for coal. So we've got this big conflict here between how we're going to deal with all of these uh, coal tenures that are in place and trying to maintain caribou. Remember the quintet herd was the only one we've got that's still relatively abundant and uh, seemingly stable within this entire DU, designatable unit in British Columbia. And this one is under serious threat if all of this coal development is to go ahead. And uh, one of the reasons it got to this is the province of uh, Dealing with the mountain caribou was a big priority. We, we got a, 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 a pretty credible uh, mountain caribou recovery strategy in place, protecting lots of habitat, and dealing with snowmobiling and so on. Uh, we've got the boreal caribou plan in place. Uh, only now are we starting, this has the province turned its attention to trying to develop a, a management plan or some sort of recovery plan for these caribou in the Tumbler Ridge area, uh, the Peace area, South Peace. And right from the start, we've already got a lot of obstacles like this in our way. So summary. So we know the seasonal movements and habitat use for all of these herds, and it's interesting because we get a lot of variation. We've got some of them that uh, winter on these windswept alpine ridges. We have others that go down these low elevation boreal forests. We've done habitat modeling and mapping to identify these core habitats. So in terms of land use planning, we know where these important areas are. We mapped the wolf movements and habitat use, and uh, this was done by a graduate student, and she submitted her thesis to us just before Christmas and asked us to read it over Christmas, which I didn't do, but that will be available soon. Unfortunately, we know most of these herds are declining. Uh, we have that based on both census data and, and, and looking at, at uh, population parameters. Major cause of, of these declines, as usual, is, is wolf predation uh, over half of the no one causes of uh, adult mortality is wolf predation. And our problem is that most of the core habitat is threatened by a wide variety of industrial activities and adequate habitat protection mechanisms are currently not in place to adequately protect the habitat from those activities. Thank you.